Thank you. Uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, and thank you, Nasser, uh, for this opportunity to present some of our work. Um, as, I, as I mentioned to Simon a little bit earlier, uh, we are somewhat, I'm somewhat of a newbie to this computational pathology field. Uh, my background is primarily in uh, mathematics and then uh, uh, computer science, applying most of these mathematics and translating these into uh, computational tools. Um, we've been doing, uh, I've been doing a lot of work in radiation oncology surgery domain and uh, now uh, starting last year in January, um, uh, I also got interested in uh, pathology. Uh, side of things which uh, came about as a, a joke from one of the pathologists who said that you know you should go deal with real problems in computational pathology um, you know stuff in radiology and surgery are, are somewhat easier so uh, taking that bait I started looking into pathology and uh, uh, we've been doing a lot of work and I'm, I'm going to talk about some of that today mainly focusing on pathology, but building uh, from uh, some of our work in radiation oncology and surgery just to show, you know, the general philosophy of the lab too. Uh, so um, I, um, I'm an assistant professor. Uh, they call us, us uh, assistant attendings in Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, uh, and uh, I lead the mathematical oncology initiative uh, here. Uh, we are rapidly expanding. Uh, up to now we have a, uh, uh, four or so uh, senior data scientists, one postdoc and uh, two PhD students that I uh, um, advise in Stony Brook where I hold a affiliate or adjunct uh, assistant professor position in applied math and statistics. So let's jump into it. Uh, this. Uh, so we do a lot of work in integrative biomedical data analysis. Uh, some of the philosophies that we bring uh, on the table from radiology, radiation oncology and uh, surgery is um, medicine is still a relatively small data paradigm with signal and a lot of noise. If you remove this noise, uh, what you're left with is small data. And in most cases, you know, deep learning approaches can work, but uh, uh, if you can uh, come up with more rigorous mathematical formulation for the same problem, uh, it allows you to do a lot of cool things, uh, especially, you know, incorporating clinical constraints or physical constraints uh, that, uh, you know, clinicians, physicians, as well as uh, 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 technicians uh, who work with the acquisition scanners, etc., have built a lot of knowledge about. And then ideally you should be able to put that in, uh, into your uh, mathematical formulation. Um, and uh, most of these uh, mathematical formulation as I'm going to show you today are readily generalizable. They work out of the box in other modalities and hence, you know, uh, 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 these are preferred. Uh, most of the work these days uh, 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 focuses, especially in the deep learning domain works, uh, focuses on HND and MRNA uh, population uh, bulk mRNA seq data, which is uh, easily accessible on uh, ECGA, um, uh, CBI portal, etc. Uh, there is uh, lesser work being done in the IHC multiplex imaging, uh, single cell RNA transcriptomics domain uh, with deep learning tools, primarily because there is not enough data and labels, etc., that are available for that. Um, so there are multiple approaches that we are taking in our group, and I'm going to talk about those uh, going forward. Um, and then since we are very heavily mathematics focused, we do a lot of deep learning, but uh, we believe that you know, uh, with mathematics, you can provide better interpretability, explainability, and generalizability across domains. And then uh, one potential use of deep learning algorithms that we've uh, uh, recently started uh, looking into is to use deep learning as an approximate solver using some newer deep learning paradigms that are coming about, uh, like deep equilibrium models, where rather than modeling the layers explicitly, you model these as implicit functions, and then you can incorporate objective functions with different constraints, etc., and you can speed things up uh, drastically with that. Um, there is also this 
big bear in the uh, room uh, with respect to explainability um, uh, for our attribution of uh, essentially clinical decisions, uh, AI clinical decisions, uh, which is also on a very shaky ground from our perspective uh, with you know attribution-based mechanism as well as attention-based mechanisms being easily thrown off by noise in the data. Um, um, and for that, uh, we very much align with the, what you guys have worked on, which is making more efficient labeling approaches uh, via nucleic, et cetera, and uh, to make sure that whatever uh, clinicians have uh, accumulated over years um, uh, in the medical school can at least be translated first on the pathology slide. So we can then readily use those features for a lot of other things, including explainability as well as, you know, uh, image search, et cetera, as well. Uh, so, so I've worked uh, primarily uh, uh, before um, starting my position here uh, in my lab uh, in the radiation oncology domain, radiology surgery, and now uh, we are also working in the pathology domain. Let me quickly just show you what uh, we've been up to in the radiation oncology domain. By the way, like all the, uh, everything I talk about uh, is uh, uh, mostly available on our uh, uh, GitHub. So uh, feel free to go check it out. Uh, we have made the data uh, publicly available. Uh, we have released all the models, Docker containers, et cetera. So in the radiation oncology domain, you have planning CT, um, uh, a patient walks in, uh, uh, if they uh, if a tumor is found, they are called back to get a planning CT. And uh, during the course of treatment, either weekly or daily, they uh, get these low dose uh, CVCT cone, cone beam CTs. Um, one of the biggest problems has been similar to the pathology domain, where the most focus has been on the H and D uh, 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 modality. Um, here in radiation oncology, people have also focused on primarily CT and not cone beam CT because it's really noisy, et cetera. Uh, so one of, the, uh, one of the works that we've been pushing for is how to make uh, the cone beam CT readily useful so you can create uh, longitudinal biomarkers out of this and then hopefully uh, 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 have better predictors of outcomes, et cetera, or even stratification of the patients or treatment response. So here we uh, have come up with new ways of translating cone beam CT into CT-like representations simultaneously do um, uh, organ at risk and GTV segmentation as well as dose prediction. And most of these works uh, are coming out right now. In the, uh, in the radiation oncology domain, especially in the pancreatic cancer, uh, lung cancer, uh, the, one of the biggest problems is when the patient breathes, uh, then you might bombard the organs at risk uh, unnecessarily. Um, uh, because most of the scans that you're working off of is, uh, are static scans. So we, are, we have created new ways of taking, for example, uh, exemplar uh, motion from a given 4D CT scan and then projecting it onto uh, uh, any downloaded TCI, uh, TCIA scan, for example, and incorporating realistic motion uh, into, uh, uh, into these scans. And this can readily be now used to uh, uh, treat uh, or have a much more personalized dose regimen for uh, per patient, hopefully avoiding OARs. Uh, we are pushing this uh, hopefully to the clinic uh, by next year. Uh, in the uh, surgery domain, um, there have been a lot of challenges, especially you know in uh, these kind of endoscopy uh, videos. Uh, we've come up with the new ways of uh, inferring depth, um, also creating synthetic CT-like representations for these uh, uh, videos um, acquired from like uh, uh, prior uh, to, the, uh, to the endoscopy procedure, um, but these don't have to be paired. So what you are seeing here, in fact, is uh, we are doing this depth inference as well as feature segmentation and uh, uh, the synthetic CT generation without using any temporal information. So there is no optical flow involved, there's nothing uh, temporal in this model. It's it's just that it's so uh, so well paired between these two modalities that actually we can do away with some of those temporal constraints, and we can still get very realistic uh, temporally consistent results for the first time. 
Um, and uh, uh, this is where I'm going to highlight this part where the use of orthogonal modalities, uh, which is seeing the same information in two different ways, allows us to bypass some of the rest, uh, restrictions or limitations of just using one modality, similar to what we did with the CT and Gombe and CT. So now, you know, focusing on pathology, obviously, um, I'm going to um, uh, sort of highlight some of the work that we are doing here. Uh, actually, when I started off, I, uh, um, I was focused on multiplex imaging, which is this next generation high dimensional imaging. Uh, for which uh, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering has invested a lot of time and resources into acquiring 20 or different, uh, 20 or more platforms, multiplex imaging platforms. The only problem that they have is, you know, there are no good analysis tools available right now to do thresholding, segmentation, etc. As we see in the H and E and IHC domain too. Uh, so, uh, so starting off from this uh, uh, multiplex imaging. We actually pulled this back into the IHC and H and E uh, domain, um, and figured that you know there might be some uh, bridge or linkages that we can draw across these three modalities to drive all uh, of them uh, in unison in terms of quantification. Obviously, there are a lot of challenges involved. Uh, the first one was the stain normalization. Uh, we uh, initially we started working with multiple instance learning attention-based models. And we saw that you know slight variations in scanners and staining throws off the attention models by uh, attention, for example, uh, by quite a bit. Similarly, with the attribution mechanisms, and so uh, the first challenge came out to be the stain normalization. And uh, from what I was told, that you know uh, people stopped working on stain normalization from the mathematical perspective quite long back, and now are heavily focused on GANs, etc. The only problem with that uh, uh, is um, uh, with respect to stain normalization is uh, you need a lot of data in the source and the target domain. And that's something that normally we don't have uh, uh, for, uh, for our work. Then we, uh, uh, we've been doing a lot of work in the radiology uh, domain in registration. So we thought, you know, let's give it a shot if we can come up with something exciting in the uh, uh, pathology side of things too. And the, the challenge here is obviously, you know, these are whole slide images, gigapixel, uh, gigapixel images, and uh, it's very challenging. Cell segmentation signal thresholding, tissue classification, and quantification is something you guys have already dealt with. So I'm just going to skip that part. All right. So starting off last year, uh, uh, we thought about, you know, what can we do um, in stain normalization. Um, and the, the idea that popped up uh, as a result was this notion of stain invariance. Can we create stain invariant uh, algorithms or deep learning models uh, that can allow us to readily sort of uh, uh, generalize um, and uh, surpass the current performance uh, capabilities that the uh, different algorithms have who, which rely on stain normalization? So, so we started looking into, um, uh, obviously, our uh, uh, pet uh, framework that we worked with was optimal mass transport, which is now as famous as you know machine learning, um, and uh, it can be used as a hammer for any problem that you can think of. Basically, what it does is it allows you to move a distribution from uh, uh, one distribution to another uh, while minimizing a certain cost function. Um, and that idea is in general so powerful that uh, it allows you to uh, readily uh, make advances in some of the fields that uh, um, uh, have somewhat locked uh, themselves down. Uh, so, for example, here I'm going to show you that let's suppose if we have V1 uh, as a source image and V2 as a reference or a target image, the target image shown, shown here. Uh, we can actually do Wasserstein interpolation uh, between these two to get uh, uh, intermediate um, staining results. For example, if this is the source image, which I call V1, and this is the target image, which I call V2, I can uh, uh, compute a Wasserstein 2 distance, W2 being Wasserstein 2 distance, uh, on this uh, uh, metric of my spaces uh, between V1 and V2. And uh, when I uh, minimize this, uh, and I can use uh, something we call a uh, regularization 
for this to smooth things out and speed it up, uh, accelerate it on GPUs, etc. This leads to a continuous family of color interpolations, uh, which you can see here. And so naturally, this framework gives us not just the normalization at the end, but it also gives us a complete continuous spectrum of these changes in the color space. Uh, we thought, all right, you know, this is exciting, but this is something that uh, already the traditional Masenko, et cetera, Steinhardt uh, algorithms can already do, which is sustain normalization based on a single target image. All right, so what more can we do than this? So then we came up with the new uh, uh, formulation, which is again based in the multi-margin was assigned by center theory. Uh, that people have presented, we just translated it into a uh, robust algorithm. So we saw that, you know, if you pick like, like a wrong reference or a target uh, image, then your stain normalization gets screwed up. And if I feed these kind of images into our models, we, uh, we have actually seen that the, the attention maps just go awry. Like they have no idea uh, what they're pointing to. And every time you run them, uh, it's going to give you a different result. As opposed to this, what we uh, did, we formulated a new uh, way of doing it, which is can we incorporate uh, intermediate reference images that when I translate uh, this color palette to this one, I can go through this palette and uh, 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 sort of improve the normalization as well as the augmentation. And with this, we were uh, able to improve things drastically. We were able to go up till uh, two marginals, uh, which are the intermediate references, and we can create like a whole spectrum of stain variations to drive machine learning algorithms with. So this, uh, this approach was readily extended out of the box without any hyperparameter uh, tuning or anything uh, to endoscopy domain. Uh, we have now extended it to three marginals in the endoscopy, and we have, uh, uh, this is unpublished work again, um, uh, and we are getting state-of-the-art results in the deep learning uh, for polyp detection, for example, in uh, this very challenging data set. So moving on, um, all right, so the, the first part I presented was stain normalization, where we can uh, derive uh, uh, was assign uh, Barry-Center interpolation in the color space. But, you know, all right, that's interesting, but what can we do more? So then uh, uh, we've been uh, working in our group uh, uh, before I started my post off um, in the vector, uh, vectorial optimal mass transport domain, where rather than uh, just uh, um, uh, transporting uh, scalar distributions, we can actually now transport or uh, match uh, vectorial distributions to where the vectorial part comes from either RGB colors in a colored image, uh, or it can also come from other kind of modalities uh, as well. And this is primarily because it's uh, formulated as a graph uh, problem. Uh, and uh, what you can... Sorry. So with this, essentially, you can start uh, uh, supporting these distributions uh, from source to target uh, uh, with a certain uh, functional, uh, uh, and you can uh, start interpolating uh, things in the color space, which is the RGB palette. And with this, things become uh, really interesting uh, for a lot of other applications. Um, so here I'm going to show some examples where we can now uh, uh, sort of interpolate between H and E, uh, HC images, as well as later I'm going to show some examples for going from H and E and uh, multiplex imaging too. For example, this is a an, uh, uh, sorry, um, it's a an HIR challenge data, which is uh, uh, deformable image registration challenge data for whole slide images. And uh, I'm going to show the, some of the results on that. So this is a vectorial uh, OMT, and uh, you can see uh, it kind of takes into account the color palette distribution in the interpolations very robustly. It doesn't uh, matter if there are artifacts in the background of one image and not the other. Uh, it can robustly translate between the two and find a very high quality vector field uh, between the two deformation vector fields.
And so this was primarily to do multi-stain uh, tissue um, interpolation between the uh, step sections, and this is uh, of interest. Uh, one of the pathologists pointed that you know there is this alopecia, uh, um, uh, which requires hair follicle counting, and it's one of the biggest challenges that's standing for like hundred years. And we wanted to see whether we can um, hopefully add uh, our bit to it by seeing if we can reconstruct these hair follicles in 3D. This is a work in progress that uh, uh, one of my senior scientists is working on. And you, as you can see, there is a, uh, by the way, this is, um, uh, uh, we started off with balanced pictorial optimal mass transport. This is uh, the unbalanced version that I'm going to, sh I'm showing here. So it allows you to even cater to changes in topology. Um, uh, if there is, for example, uh, you will see in this next slide, there is rupture in the tissue here. We can still interpolate between the two. And we are hoping that you know we can, uh, using this framework, uh, add plus some other frameworks that we have worked on previously, uh, something called Ritchie Flow, uh, where we we'd be able to constrain uh, uh, vectorial ONT with uh, uh, certain landmarks that uh, user can provide and uh, uh, speed up the process there too. And now we have uh, we are already also formulating this as a neural ODE, which allows us to speed things up uh, uh, and scale scale it up to whole slide images too. All right, so this was this was HND focused uh, part that I just showed you: stain normalization, registration, HND, and IHC. Then we wanted to see whether we can bridge HND, IHC, and high dimensional imaging in some useful way using Again, uh, certain uh, staining protocols that uh, my collaborators, uh, Travis Holman, for example, has created in his lab, where we can do de novo staining of the slide by first doing it with uh, um, uh, multiplex staining, then doing it with IHC and then uh, HND, and then we can register all of them to create like very interesting data sets to kind of translate uh, between one modality or the other. So here, for example, I'm going to show you some uh, staining uh, results that uh, we have gotten so far, where we can do HND to DAPI, we can do IHC PDL1 to DAPI plus PDL1, and this allows us to do a lot of interesting stuff uh, going forward. This is a work in progress. Uh, we initially, when we were starting out, we were uh, excited about you know whether we can do a translation between the HND images to DAPI while doing the segmentation simultaneously. Um, uh, we got a lot of interesting results there. This is still unpublished, um, uh, but a lot of other interesting work is coming up based on this. Uh, so first, one of the first models that we released uh, on our GitHub was this thing called Deep Life uh, for deep learning inferred immunofluorescence for IHC quantification. Uh, we wanted to see whether we can uh, do IHC quantification using uh, uh, co-registered uh, uh, multiplex modalities. Obviously, once you are tr once you have trained the model, you don't need the multiplex side of things uh, anymore. You can directly take the IHC as input and produce all these uh, multiple modalities on the right uh, automatically. And uh, so this work actually uh, uh, gained a lot of traction. This is now uh, licensed to PJI and will be the first uh, deep learning model in the is uh, FE approved uh, slide view. Um, so here the idea is that you have IHC images, which are primarily IHC KI67 uh, images, and uh, we have these corresponding hematoxylin channel, uh, MPIF DAPI, which is the multiplex immunofluorescence channel. Um, we also found this new marker, which hasn't been used before, which is called LAP2 beta, uh, and this is a nuclear envelope marker, which apparently uh, we we are the first ones to figure out that uh, uh, this has more than 95% coverage uh, in all tissues that uh, we sort of looked in, into. And this kind of allows us to naturally separate out uh, touching nuclei, overlapping nuclei in very interesting ways. By itself, if you infer these and you overlay it on your IHC images, actually it gives you a lot of interesting information even without segmentation. And we have obviously the segmentation side of things uh, that we uh, incorporate into our model. And you know, given IHCKI67, uh, in a lot of 
uh, interesting and open source uh, publicly available benchmark data sets. We were able to, uh, 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 we succeeded in getting a lot of uh, interesting results with the best performances across uh, various models. Uh, we were able to, although we just trained it on KI-67, uh, I'd see KI-67 images, we were able to generalize it to multiple markers. And most of these are nuclear and uh, slightly cytoplasmic markers like CD3, CD8. Uh, but most surprising to, to, uh, for us was that this model apparently worked out of the box on h and images. Uh, and uh, I'll just show you some results. All of these are uh, on BioArchive. Uh, this paper is uh, under review in Nature Machine Intelligence. Hopefully, uh, it'll go through. And uh, so the idea here is, for example, we have uh, this massive data uh, uh, repository that we kind of put together from Patronet, which was recently published in Scientific Reports. DC data set from Mekai 20, Nucleic, obviously, your work, IHCs, uh, DLBCL MOF data set, which also came out in, I think, January 21. Then you have the millions of IHC uh, tissue microarray images on human protein atlas. We have Monuseric, TNBC, and PanNuke that we have tested too. And so, so I'm first, let me uh, show you the results that uh, uh, primarily this is the training data that we have, and then we were able to actually generalize to all these other clusters that I showed you. Uh, all these, all this, uh, all code, train models, data, etc. Everything is available on our GitHub. Uh, the, these are some of the results from uh, the K67 Human Protein Atlas. Uh, where, you know, these are uh, not that high resolution images, but we were still able to get very high uh, res uh, DAP, lab 2 k 67 as well as presentation results based on these. Uh, for lung cancer, breast cancer, um, uh, colorectal cancer, um, uh, even prostate cancer, for example. And then out of the box, uh, when we input h and &E images, we can also get uh, very high quality hematoxin, DAPI, as well as the segmentations uh, from these without even being trained on any agent images. And that might be the, uh, um, the hypothesis that we have is because you know the way we are doing the staining is we are kind of deconvolving uh, the stains in hematoxin. And by the way, when we put an agent &E image, uh, uh, we get hematoxin and in the MPIF, Protein marker, which I didn't show here, actually it's the eosin channel that we get separated out, um, and that was that came as a big surprise to us. Um, uh, and uh, so, out of the box, uh, apparently the D5 model trained on the IHC K67 nuclear images apparently works pretty well on the H and images too. Obviously, we can fine tune it further to uh, drastically improve the results, but uh, the the DAPI etc. is really high quality, and we have done. Uh, SSIM and a lot of other visual Turing uh, measures that we have reported in our paper on biochemistry. So, uh, you know, one thing that we wanted to push for was whether, you know, we can have our model sit on a, uh, uh, NVIDIA uh, NanoJet um, with a microscope and then readily do, for example, quantification on the microscope itself. So these are the images that we have from the microscope. Uh, with which we can actually now uh, directly uh, uh, get uh, high quality uh, uh, KI67 proliferation index scoring done with it. And um, let me, I can get back to this. Quickly. We have uh, tested it across like multiple, uh, uh, multiple tissue types, 10 different cancer type tissue types, etc. And uh, we are getting pretty stable results on that end. And let me quickly just show you one uh, demo that we are about to release. Uh, so this is a cloud native uh, platform uh, that we are going to release hopefully this week. Um, there now you will be able to, any pathologist can uh, upload their uh, images, for example, uh, just to begin. And you'll be able to uh, get the results which you can download. Uh, use it uh, for your own deep learning algorithms or uh, just use it out of the box for uh, for your work in research. Uh, this is again like uh, completely for non-commercial and non-clinical purposes. This is for research purposes that we are releasing this tool uh, and this should be online uh, in next, uh, uh, this week, hopefully by the end of this week.
So then uh, another thing that we wanted to do uh, in the multiplex domain, which is another challenging uh, domain by itself, because uh, across a lot of platforms, you might get higher resolution, but you get a lot of noise in the background too. So similar to uh, what you guys have been working on in the new click, with new click and uh, other tools that are coming after that, uh, we though there aren't many uh, annotations or segmentation, manual segmentation that exists in the multiplex domain. So we wanted to formulate our deep learning model in a way that we can allow uh, scribbles uh, to be added. Uh, uh, We can allow scribbles to be added at the training time rather than inference time. Uh, and so what we did, we formulated this problem as a multitask uh, deep learning problem where we are doing uh, unsupervised denoising as well as segmentation based on these uh, initial scribbles that you provide uh, on the training time and uh, doing the inference uh, right there and then. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this turned out to be really successful. Uh, we have tested it across uh, multiple platforms and with simple scribbles like these, you can get very high quality segmentations. Uh, the tip, the, and then, yeah, for example, here you can provide background and just these minimal background and foreground scribbles and you are able to get very high quality segmentations based on that. We have tested it across like multiple platforms, Vectra, um, Maybe as well, and uh, uh, I'm just showing some examples here for lung, uh, small cell, uh, adrenoca and adenocarcinoma. Uh, so again, this tool is available on uh, our GitHub. We are going to integrate this with the uh, deep cell label, which is another uh, uh, competing tool um, to do whole cell segmentation. And so the idea here is that uh, we have uh, this pipeline where you are given, for example, two channels. Now we can cater to multiple two, more than two, um, where you provide scribbles in the for the nuclear and let's suppose the cytoplasm, some minimal amount of scribbles. And then uh, we do blind spot denoising uh, using, for example, uh, right now we are using um, uh, uh, void, uh, noise to void uh, algorithm with, uh, within our framework. We have improved this further actually after this. Uh, so this um, pattern is slightly outdated, but um, then we can do factor decomposition to do uh, uh, to get uh, the nuclear as well as whole, uh, the cytoplasm segmentations. Um, we are um, uh, as a result of formulating that uh, as a uh, 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 sort of an uncertainty quantification problem too. We can also get uh, entropy variance as well, which then uh, can be used by a user to add additional scribbles in uh, regions where uh, the nuclei are not well separated or are not well segmented to uh, do multiple iterations and hopefully improve that part. Um, so a prototype of uh, the integration with deep cell label, which is completely based in web browser uh, is being shown here, where you can provide some minimal number of scribbles for nuclear, for example, this is uh, maybe images which are really noisy images. You provide some minimal number of uh, foreground and background scribbles. Uh, and live, uh, you can uh, see uh, the results changing. This is the ground truth. Uh, and then we can, uh, in the channel, I'm going to show uh, live results uh, for the, the segmentation part as well. And this is for cytoplasm now. Right. So uh, here you are seeing uh, uh, the intermediate epoch results where things are changing live. Uh, the user will be able to interact with these uh, uh, scribbles while they are training, stop them, and then add additional scribbles and then uh, improve the results till they're uh, satisfied. So this is a work in progress. This is just an initial prototype we put together. Uh, actually, just for this presentation, but uh, we are going to have like a deeper integration with deep cell label, image J, QPath, uh, as well as Nepari going forward. So basically, what we have here is uh, we have an input. Uh, 
uh, uh, where you can provide some minimal amount of scribbles. This is a site pulse marker, pan CK. Um, then you have uh, uh, the nuclear marker, uh, uh, which is DSDNA in case of maybe and DAPI in case of Vitra. Um, and you can see that uh, we can get very high quality results, which uh, uh, align well with the, uh, the ground truth segmentation that is, uh, uh, was created by uh, two technicians and uh, trained pathologists who supervise this annotation process. Um, and then uh, using this, we can get really high quality results that can then be used for uh, other downstream tasks that I'm going to show now. Uh, so again, the this tool is again available on our uh, GitHub. All right. So so now uh, uh, up till here, uh, when uh, similar to for example uh, the Hovernet, uh, you are able to get different cell composition uh, uh, and segmentations based on uh, uh, impartial as well as uh, deep life. But there is no spatial uh, uh, relationships that you are kind of utilizing to do spatial biomarker quantification. And that's something which is the ultimate goal of our work. So we've been uh, putting in a lot of effort in this thing called spatial profiling toolbox, which is purely advanced mathematical uh, uh, techniques up till now that we have put in it. Uh, um, spectral analysis, optimal mass transport, a couple of other things that are coming uh, down the road. Uh, and this is again available on uh, our GitHub. And the idea here eventually is that we want to be able to, um, so for example, using vector or uh, optimal mass transport, we'd be able to connect um, uh, uh, multiplex uh, cell graphs, for example, uh, multiplex imaging cell graphs, uh, are, which either come from uh, uh, our deep life tool or via impartial if the starting point is multiplex imaging. Uh, and combine these with, uh, let's suppose, flow cytometry data, single cell RNA seq data, uh, from which we can again compute graphs um, and put them together in this vectorial distribution because essentially they might come from the same samples, etc. Um, and also maybe incorporate uh, spatial transcriptomics. Obviously, there is a lot of work being done in that domain. And we will readily use whatever is widely available and then just interoperate our uh, spatial profiling toolbox with those. We don't want to reinvent the wheel in that domain. Um, for current pipeline uh, functionality, we do phenotype proximity analysis, phenotype density analysis, tumor front distance analysis, diffusion dispersion, uh, spatial analysis, and all of these are available on our uh, spatial profiling toolbox. We also give, uh, uh, we also uh, have a starting point from nature breast uh, a nature 2020 uh, breast uh, cancer paper uh, which used the IMC uh, data and we have kind of pre-processed that and made available via this uh, spatial profiling toolbox for you to kind of uh, go through these entire workflows in a much more holistic way. Um, in the future, a lot of other interesting stuff is coming. We are going to use higher order statistics of cell morphology, etc. using um, um, uh, this advanced mathematical uh, formulation uh, that uh, one of my senior data scientists has uh, put together. We are obviously going to do a lot of work in graph neural networks, um, uh, maybe just using histocartography and adding our mathematical formulations on top of that. Um, uh, the current problem with the traditional uh, graph neural networks, um, as most of you know, most probably, is that uh, uh, it mostly relies on the node degree features and node degree distribution. It doesn't take into account the, uh, uh, the surrounding uh, local uh, structure, the graph structure holistically. And there we are going to add a lot of interesting stuff there uh, using curvature, Ritchie curvature, um, uh, graph, um, Gaussian mixture transport, et cetera, that we actually published uh, last year in PNA. Uh, with which we were able to find uh, some very interesting uh, biomarkers that are now uh, uh, going into preclinical studies. So for the spatial profiling toolbox, again, uh, the focus of the lab is to create uh, things that are very usable and interoperable uh, with the, uh, with various tools that are out there. Um, and so we we put in a lot of effort making it uh, uh, compatible. Uh, combined with other tools. Uh, we are using Nextflow, for example, 
next flow uh, uh, workflow processing engine to make these readily deployable across HPC cluster, cloud, AWS, uh, Google, etc., and local machines, as well as incorporating uh, these new uh, uh, workflow processing uh, engines called. Um, uh, um, yeah, there are a lot of things that. And then we actually recently came up with a new uh, higher order statistics uh, coincidence test, uh, we call it. Uh, and this is also available um, on our GitHub. Uh, in the preliminary applications, we have done uh, single cell, spatial cell profiling to figure out uh, valid combinations of uh, uh, multiplex markers, multiplex imaging markers. We have also validated, independently validated using this statistical test. Um, some of the earlier work that we uh, that was published last year in PNAS. Uh, there are a lot of applications of this, um, and I would strongly urge people to um, whoever are more mathematically oriented and are interested in these applications to go look at our GitHub as well as the archive paper that we have with it. Uh, we'll be uh, do we'll be releasing code and data for a lot of these other applications going forward too. Um, and maybe I should. Um, uh, where we are heading with the deep life, etc. Uh, the goal wasn't just to do uh, uh, nuclear or cell translation between two modalities. We want to go much bigger. Uh, PDL, uh, we want to uh, be able to translate between, uh, let's go PDL1. IHC is to do quantification or uh, expression quantification, PDL1 expression quantification in immune and uh, tumor cells to come up with more reproducible scores. Uh, which is one of the biggest issues right now. Um, and then um, I think most of these things, uh, I think people in the audience are well aware of. So I'll just stop here. Um, and uh, these are my lab members who have uh, worked on most of these things that are presented today. Um, and please, uh, uh, if you're interested in more, more of our work, please visit our website. Uh, feel free to email me and then follow us on uh, Twitter and uh, we'll update you on uh, other cool stuff that we release going forward in the future. And with that, uh, I'll thank everyone for attending this and uh, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. All right, thanks, right, Sal. So. Fantastic presentation now. So I think, so I think I like I said, we're going to open up the floor now, now to questions. questions. Um, hopefully, there's a bit of a discussion on, on, on the things that you discussed in your presentation. So, maybe I'll kick off um, with a question. So, it's really nice to see that that linear transformation from your source image to your target image. So, how how do you think so you can non-linear transformation <laughs> transformation from your linear to your to your source image to your target image? So, how do you think you can use those intermediate results um, for downstream applications? I mean, one thing that came to my mind was potentially using it for augmentation. Um, do you do you foresee you in the future in that way? So that was uh, the exact uh, what was the paper was on in last year, Mikai, which was basically using it for normalization as well as augmentation. And using the augmentation strategy, actually, we were able to improve the results drastically. Uh, that's what we have reported in the paper uh, for, for example, the Monisec data where out of the box using uh, traditional uh, convolutional neural networks which were published previously. By just adding these augmentations, we improved the performance drastically. Okay, so you compared with the normalized results of the end the normalized result. results. And we compared with even actually GAN, some of the GAN based uh, uh, norm, um, normalization strategies. Um, and in those cases, for example, like uh, in Monisec, for example, specifically, um, you don't have a lot of data for all possible tissues or cancer types, right? And uh, the data that was kind of put together was from TCGA, you know, randomly putting patches from one scanner and the other into this one data set. In order to drive GAN based algorithms, obviously, you need a lot of data from the source and target domain to be able to do the translation. But with our approach, we could do it out of the box. So I like to see as well, you, you use that one marker to help separate your nuclei. So for your segmentation based algorithm. So do you yeah. think 
Most of us should be using something like that to help separate nuclei for automated segmentation based methods. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's what we are going to show now uh, by releasing our tool, uh, hopefully uh, by the end of this week, uh, that you know anyone can upload the images and get very high quality of MPIF as well as these lab to marker images. And another, I think, angle that we perhaps can finally think about is that in M or multiplex domain, a lot of people do uh, for pixel based analysis. They don't do segmentation based analysis because, you know, there aren't good segmentation tools out there. But if we can kind of infer these kind of uh, nuclear envelope markers like lab to beta, we can actually start thinking about pixel based uh, quantification too, perhaps. Uh, because that kind of allows you to separate out the noise and the, uh, in the background from the foreground and can hopefully address some of those questions too. So do you think you could potentially use um, like a student teacher style network to from before see potentially that being used in the future? Yes, absolutely. I think that's a that's a that's a very uh, interesting direction that we are hoping to kind of pursue going forward. Um, and maybe even translate some of these uh, was assigned by center formulations as loss functions in our uh, module and drive as you're saying student uh, teacher networks as well. Great. Have we got any questions from the audience? Uh, Simon, uh, first of all, Saad, thank you very much for a great talk. We really enjoyed it. Um, some really exciting stuff. Uh, that I wasn't familiar with, um, so so thank you for bringing that to our attention. I do have a couple of quick questions, but um, I see that David has posted a couple of questions in the chat as well. So Simon, you may want to field those first. Okay, sure. So um, yeah, I'll I'll actually read out exactly what David said. So um, so first of all. Let's go with the with the most recent one. So David said, um, Ricky Flow needs um, right Romanian metrics. How are these metrics defined? Right. So uh, in our case, like we define them uh, using triangular meshes uh, that we can project on top of these images, and using those we drive uh, 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 the Ricky Flow um, in in this man using the Romani manifold. Uh, and uh, 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 we don't work on the pixel level themselves, although we can, but it requires certain kind of topology or the manifold to be projected onto these images to be able to use it more coherently. And the nice thing about using Ricci flow is that when you project these triangular meshes on top of these images, you can create hierarchical representations where you can go from more coarse triangular representations to more finer representations. And with that, we can derive, for example, this image registration using la landmark based uh, 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 algorithms in a much more rigorous way. For example, using what you guys have done with the Hovernet as well as tissue level classification, we can use those uh, representations as landmarks by creating like a hierarchical representation and then doing uh, outcomes prediction or even registration based on that. Great. Hopefully that's answered your question, David. Um, so I'm going to read out. I'm not sure whether it's a question or a comment, but the other one that uh, David had. So he, he said there is now a much better form of endoscopy where the patient swallows a small pill containing two cameras. The pill transmits the results by Wi-Fi. Yeah. Um, so this is called capsule capsule endoscopy, wireless uh, capsule endoscopy. It's fine, you know. There are a lot of uh, techniques that have tried to, uh, you know, throw out the current endoscopy procedures. The problem with these uh, wireless capsule, capsule endoscopy images is that, uh, first of all, there has to be like a battery in these capsules, so uh, the resolution of the images is first of all low, and then they can stuck in a certain, uh, you know, region and not be very useful <laughs> in the end. Uh, and as a kind of a, a throwback, you will have to do perform the actual procedure again. So from our perspective, we want to create, uh, and that's why actually we wanted to create algorithms which are very frame based and not temporally uh, uh, based uh, because uh, if you have like a big jump between the images that were uh, kind of acquired between these uh, wireless capsule endoscopies, then uh, you might not have a strong linkage or optical flow to drive one to the other. And that's why now what we have created is readily applicable to the wireless uh, capsule endoscopy side of things too. OK, 
Okay, thanks. Nasser, do you want to go ahead with your questions? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so it seems to me that the deep life um, work is um, aimed at kind of virtual staining. First of all, do I understand that correctly? Yes, so absolutely. So the idea was, in fact, to um, um, when we started off, it wasn't virtual restaining wasn't the focus. It was more like how we can augment features from multiple modalities to reach like a consensus. Uh, but it turned out that you know this uh, virtual restaining actually came out to be something that people got more excited about. <laughs> uh, that you know without having to spend so much money on doing the staining out of the box, you are getting these high quality results uh, and which are platform independent, which is something really cool. You know that's amazing. I mean, if you can go from H and E to uh, CD3, CD8, KI7 images. That would be really amazing. My only slight concern there, and I, I want to know what your experience is, is like, um, is that in reality, you may have two neighboring cells. One of them might be, let's say, CD3 positive, and the other one might be CD3 negative. But morphologically, on the HNE, they appear exactly the same. So, so how do you differentiate between two cells that appear to be exactly the same under the HNE um, stain? But in reality, one of them is positive and the other one is negative. How, how can you tease those those things out? Right. So this is something that we have thought a lot about. Um, so so normally, like uh, uh, one way you would have gone about, uh, first of all, like this is just going back a little bit uh, behind the philosophy of, you know, why we put together Deep Life and did it in this way. You could have easily taken like there are publicly available data sets of multiplex immunofluorescence images and H&E images and you can do unpaired translation between the two to get some results out, right? Uh, so we wanted to do something much more exhaustive in the sense that we wanted to stain the same slide with multiplex and the same slide with H&E. So in the end, the representation that we get can easily distinguish whether you know this cell on the H and D is positive or this cell right next to it is negative or not. Right? This is a complete objective way of looking at it. And then we spent a lot of time, you know, perfecting the registration path such that you know we can overcome these issues in a much more rigorous way. And now the going forward, the idea is similar to what you guys did with PanNuke, where you can add multiple class annotation labels. We will be using these multiplex representations to provide objective labels for Pan, CK, SOX10, uh, CD3, CD8, you know, macrophage markers, etc., in a much more objective way. Because you know we are not relying on manual annotations, where in some cases, as we know, at least in the macrophages or immune cells, you might even after the consensus of five pathologists, you might not have a strong enough consensus, right? And that's something, for example, Path AI, the path that they took was that they hired 500 pathologists for doing uh, annotations. They take five uh, consensus of five pathologists on, on the tumor, immune, and macrophage markers. And in then the correlation that they found for macrophage was less than 20%. Uh, for immune cells, it was 50%, and for tumor cells, it was 80 so meaning that there is already something you can do about tumors, but when it comes to immune macrophage and these other rare phenotypes, you need to have some more objective way of uh, kind of putting that representation on top of your original site. And that's something that uh, we strongly believe uh, we can achieve with this kind of multiplex immunofluorescence uh, stain. So you will still need the multiplex. You're not going to be able to do that with is that yes so and the cool thing was that once we released deep life we have now gotten uh, data sets from five or six different institutions who have already had this kind of data but they use it primarily for validation purposes so they said that you know we have h and &E images or ihc images and corresponding pan ck cd3 macrophage markers can you do the registration for us, do the training and release it back to the community? So actually, that's exactly what we are going to do as a kind of a next step. That's great. Looking forward to those publicly available data sets. That would so be... By the way, like the great. data sets in Deep Life is already publicly available if uh, on the Nogo. Fantastic. Looking forward to more of those as well. Great work. Absolutely. And thank you. Uh, thank you again uh, for 
the amazing work you guys have done uh, especially with releasing new click overnight etc and I, we are hoping that we can kind of uh, walk the same footsteps and you know make our contributions in this domain too Thanks so much, Tinsar. So I think with that, we can conclude the seminar. So it's been fantastic to have you um, join us and give that great presentation. Um, so yeah, thanks again. And um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and uh, giving me the opportunity to present our work. I hope we can interact more going forward in the future. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Sir. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.